Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at Trinity. Grateful to have all of you here today, especially guests who are here on this fifth Sunday after Easter. It's Confirmation Day. We continue with our overall theme, Resurrection Renewal, specifically Resurrection Confirmation is our theme, our message when we get to that time of the sermon. What What a wonderful day for our confirmands and their families as they reaffirm the faith that the Lord planted in them at their baptism. Let's begin with the opening hymn, Speak, O Lord, on page 3. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment. 
both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. On this Confirmation Day, we give our confirmants an opportunity to confess their faith. Uh, this year, again, by a series of essays that they've written on various subjects, all very well done, and they have something to say to us in each of them. We get to go alphabetically. We don't draw straws or anything, so we'll start with Brindley Bennett, speaking of the comfort of omnipresence. Think of your darkest moment, a time when you felt alone, desperate, trapped. Maybe it was over five years ago, last week, or even right now. The fact of the matter is, you were never truly alone. We are never alone. Our God, the only true God, is an omnipresent God. That means that he is with all of us at one time. Right now, God is right next to you. He is also with our brothers and sisters in all parts of the world. Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10 tell us, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. What comfort these words can bring us. We are very sinful people. None of us have done anything to deserve God let alone an omnipresent God. Since our God is a loving God, he has had mercy on us. He won't leave you because of the sins you commit. His commitment to you and me is unconditional. That assurance is priceless. Emmanuel is a common name for God. Matthew 1 verse 23 says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Have you ever tried to do multiple things at one time? Was it kind of hard to manage? Think of God as the ultimate multitasker. He does an infinite number of things all at the same time. How blessed are we to have such a skilled God? The, the fact that God is omnipresent makes our worship services so much more remarkable also. Matthew 18 verse 20 says, For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. What an honor to be by him. Our eternal Father never stops watching over us. If you think that your darkness is too dark, you are so wrong. You are never out of sight from God. Trust him to be your light and overcome whatever your personal darkness is. As Isaiah 41 verse 10 tells us, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. He will never cast you aside. There are no limits to what God can do for you or what he can help you through. So the next time you feel alone, remember that God is always by your side. He is going to help you through whatever you are facing. You need only be still. Thank you, Brindley. Next is Madison Frudenwald. Her essay's title is The Assurance of Omniscience. Madison. What is suicide? We all think of it as something we never want to happen. But what about the people that didn't finish it? What was going through their minds? Was it, does God really love me? Maybe I'm here for a reason. Why did they stop? If someone went through with it, we would all be asking God, 
we would all be asking God why. We would be thinking, why did he allow it to happen? We love them. Only God will ever know the good and the bad. He will know the stuff we didn't. Isn't it scary that God knows everything? He knows why everything happened. You could be, you could be a minute from pulling the trigger, but you don't. It says in Proverbs 15, verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. God knows why everything happened. He knows when you helped the old lady cross the street or when you talked badly about someone. We all know that bad things come in the world, but that doesn't mean we should turn away from God. In your life, God is the only one that will ever know how many hairs are on your head. As it says in Matthew 10, verse 30, and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. In Psalms 147, verse 4, it says, he counts the number of the stars, he calls them all by name. I'm sure the shamaners don't even know that. So why would someone ever want to turn away from God? Because he's all-powerful and all-knowing. In my own life, there's been death in my family, divorce, and marriages, but I never looked at the happy things. I always looked at the sad things that tear me farther apart from God, rather than bring me closer. I just had to think that God has a plan for everything, just like he knows everything. It says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God knows when something will happen. He knows when you buy a new vehicle or have a child when you move. He knows everything. He knows the good and the bad. Maybe it could be why you looked at something bad or helped your parents with the chores. You could be one years old and he knows when you die, when you will get married, and when you will have your first heartbreak. He would know, he would, he would be the only one to know you have cancer before you're ever born. Only God will ever know. Most importantly, he knows exactly what I need when I need. Rather than scare me, it actually comforts me to know God knows all and that he is always working for my good. Our Lord knows why everything happens. He knows the good and the bad. So why turn away from him? Thank you, Madison. Next, Davis Cuck. Staying focused on Christ in a distracted world. Staying focused can be a very difficult thing to do. As humans, it's easy for our minds to wander, which can cause a whole host of problems. Losing our focus spiritually can cause eternal problems. There are a number of examples in Scripture of people who lost their focus on Christ. Thankfully, we have wonderful examples of those who stayed focused on Christ. Some examples of those who lost their focus on Christ include Adam and Eve, Lot's wife, and Judas, who is one of Jesus' disciples. In Genesis 3, verse 6, we read that, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruits and ate, and she also gave it to her husband, and he also ate. In Genesis, we read about Lot's wife, whose focus was on earthly things, not following God's wishes. Genesis 19, verse 26 says, But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Finally, in Matthew 26, verse 14 through 16, we learn of Judas and where his heart's focus was. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief of the priest, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Some examples of those who kept their focus on Christ include Noah, David, and Job. In 1 Samuel 17, we learn of a young David whose confidence was in Christ. Scripture says, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Then there is Noah. Think of all the ridicule and harassment he must have received as he went about his work of building the ark. In Hebrews 11, verse 7, it says, By faith, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. We all know of the extraordinary loss of Job, Yet Job proclaims in Job 13, verse 15, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. So how can we stay focused on Christ in a so unfocused a society? Not only does God's word provide good examples of past saints for us, but it also provides encouragement. In Philippians 4, verse 13, we read, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Staying connected to word and sacrament is so important for us. In Titus 3, verse 5, it says, 
He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. And in John 6, verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the life, which the world is my flesh. A final thought I want to leave you with is in Romans 8, verse 31. It reads, what then shall in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Christ wants us to remain focused on him and his word, so he is with us every step of the journey to help us. Thank you, Davis. Our first scripture lesson is the Old Testament reading from Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and courageous, because you will divide this land among these people, this land which I swore to their fathers that I would give to this people. Just be strong and very courageous. Be careful to act according to the entire law which my servant Moses commanded for you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may succeed wherever you go. This book of the law must never depart from your mouth, and you are to meditate on it day and night, so that you will act faithfully according to everything written in it, because then you will prosper in everything you do, and you will succeed. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified, and do not be overwhelmed, because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The word of the Lord. We have two more essays to hear. First of all, Summer Smith speaking to us about the security of omnipotence. Summer? God is all powerful. He is able to forgive your sins if you repent. When you pray to God, he hears everything and he will forgive you for your sins. He will answer your prayers if you have faith, and faith is God's gift to us in the first place. Matthew 19.26 says, Jesus said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. When Jesus died on that cross, he took in all of those sins, every single one. He forgave and he will forgive. God is loving and forgiving. John 3.16 God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever shall believe in him shall not die but have, have eternal life. Jeremiah 32.17 Our Lord, you, make, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. This explains that how God made heaven and earth with his great power he is powerful. Romans 1.20 For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. This explains how God's powers have been clearly seen through his creation and has been understood from what has been made by him. God has made everything in this world. On Judgment Day, God decides whether you are going to live eternal life in heaven and be with him or go to hell without him forever. Because you believe in Jesus died on the cross for you, you, for us, faith which God himself created in us as a gift, God will accept you into his kingdom of heaven so you may live eternal life. God is powerful. God keeps us safe. He is stronger than all of our problems. Romans 35 to 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine, or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered sheep as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life 
neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or nothing else in all creation will be able to separate us from the life that God, of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing can separate us from Jesus Christ our Lord as love and faith are too strong to be separated. God is powerful in so many ways that can be shown, and I know this is true because God is watching over me, my family, my grandpa, and I know my, my grandpa is in heaven. Thank you, Summer. And finally, Katya Slovyov, speaking to us about trusting God in the midst of hardships. Katya. Your five-year-old son dies after a four-year-long battle with cancer. Your teenage daughter dies in a drunk driving accident because a man was too drunk. Or in my personal experience, my dad died in a work accident. These are all things that can happen in your life. When these hardships occur, you could turn away from God. You could blame him for everything that has happened to you. You could turn away from him and hate him. Or you're drawn closer to God. You start to have a closer relationship with him. When hardships occur, you might want to blame God. In that time, it's hard to understand God's plan. But that's for God to know and us to find out. Psalm 46 verse 1 tells us, God is our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in trouble. We never should doubt God. We should never not trust him. God always has a plan. He will help us handle whatever comes our way. Whatever happens to us, God is there for us. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 1 verse 9. When a Christian dies, you go to their funeral. When, at that funeral, hymns are sung, Bible passages are read, and God brings comfort. At that funeral, you know you're not alone. People are there with you. God is there with you. In that sad time, God brings comfort. There's a singer, Ryan Stevenson, who wrote the song, Eye of the Storm. In it are the words, in the eye of the storm, you remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. These words can be comforting in any trouble. When bad things happen, God will see you through. He knows what, he, what, what he's doing. God's got a plan. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. If the word of God isn't comforting, then I don't know what is. Trusting God in the midst of hardships isn't easy, but hopefully it draws you closer to him. When bad things happen, turning away from God isn't the answer. No matter what happens, God is on your side. He knows what's best for you. Romans 8 verse 31 says, If God's for us, who can be against us? If you trust in God, you have no reason to be afraid. No man can do anything to separate you from God. And when you trust God, that, I know, can get you through anything. Thank you, Katya. Will the congregation please stand for the reading of the gospel? This is also the sermon text for today, John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he is going to cut off. And he prunes every branch that does bear fruit, so that it will bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I am going to remain in you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Likewise, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me, and I in him, is the one who bears much fruit, because without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you continue to bear much fruit, 
and prove to be my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. At this time, we'll have a children's message. Young children are invited to the front. Um, third, fourth grade or so and younger, you are welcome to come to the front and have a seat on the front step. We have a few takers. Awesome. Thanks for coming up, everybody. So I have a branch here, guys. Everybody can see what that looks like. Does that look like it's pretty alive, or is it on life support, or is it dead? What do you think? It looks pretty dead. Can we save it? Can we do CPR? Rhett, Roman, you guys want to do CPR in this thing? No? Um, could we put it in water? Would that save it? It's maybe for a little while, but it's, it's too far gone. How about we pray over it? How about we lay hands on it or something? No. Um, this just is an illustration. Jesus just said that we branches need to remain in him. He's the vine. He's the tree. But if we are cut off from him, once you're cut off, you can look healthy, and this doesn't look that healthy anymore, but you can see a lot of branches outside, and they have fallen off, and they look green. They look healthy, but they're dead. So as Christians, we want to stay attached as branches into Jesus, the vine. Because if we become unattached, the only way we get fixed is if he fixes us, because we can't fix that. Let's bow our heads for a quick prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this day, for confirmation, and for your word as a reminder that you are the one, you choose us, you bring us into your family, you make us a part of your kingdom. Help us to stay close to you, to remain as branches in your vine. With your help, amen. Thanks for coming up, guys, gals. We'll continue with the next hymn, In Christ Alone.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture for our meditation is the gospel as read from John chapter 15. In the name of Jesus our Savior, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus doesn't say, I am Starbucks. Need an espresso boost? Need some caffeine? I'm your guy. He doesn't say, I am Fleet Farm, Walmart, or Amazon. Anything you need materially, physically, I will provide that. He doesn't say, I am your iPhone. I can connect you to anyone, anytime, anywhere, and I can get you to waste all kinds of time looking at my screen. What Jesus says is something much more profound more all-encompassing. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He states it as a fact. I am the vine. You are the branches. Speaking to his disciples back then and to his disciples here today, he doesn't say that we should strive to become branches, that we are, in fact, branches in the true vine. How did that happen? Can we give some credit to the branches, maybe? We just talked about that in the kids' message. Could a dead branch lying in your yard just jump up by itself and attach itself to the nearest tree, thereby becoming alive again? No. The life and the growth come from the tree. It doesn't happen that way. Jesus says here, the life comes from me. And he also says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Jesus says, you are branches of me, the vine, because of my word, because of what I have done for you. And a few verses later in verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. You and I are not able to choose the date and time of our physical birth. We don't do that. Maybe mom and dad had a chance to have a part in that. But we also don't get to choose the day and time of our spiritual birth. We're helpless. We're lifeless, dead branches. Rather than accept what God offers by nature, we reject it. Rather than open our hearts to God, we keep them closed unable by nature to choose Christ or to decide for Christ or to come to him. We're simply not able to do that. Whether our sins tend toward petty or felony, small or large, known or unknown, doesn't matter. Sin is sin. One sin condemns. And each one of us works up a pretty impressive list of sins every single day to say nothing of all life long. Before we ever thought to send a friend request God's way, he set out to make us his friends. He sent his son Jesus who said, no one has greater love than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. He did exactly that on the cross. Paid the price for sin, with the innocent, bloody sacrifice of his own life, then took his life back on Easter morning alive forever and ever. And the connection was completed when God the Father took you and me, lifeless, helpless, dead branches by nature, and grafted us into the vine, Jesus. For many people here, and certainly for our five confirmands, that happened at baptism. But whenever you came to faith, it was the word of Jesus that made you clean. He chose you. And it is the word of Jesus that continues to lead you to daily repentance and faith. That's the good news. That's all the good news. So how do we respond to that? One word. It occurs eight times here in these verses. Eight verses, eight times. Remain. Jesus says again and again, remain in me. 
How do we do that? Well, only through Christ and his word. There's no other way. Branches must remain in the vine. Branches, believers, can't separate themselves from Jesus and wander around for a while and then come back. Because unattached branches cannot reattach themselves. They may look leafy and green and alive. Just look at some of the stuff lying around in your yard. But it's dying, and it is, it is soon to be dead. It is as good as dead. In the original Greek language, the word remain means to live on a permanent basis, to make God's word our home, to find truth, find home in the truth of the gospel. Chances are, unless you're out of town, you come home every night. If you're in town, you don't stay at somebody else's house overnight. You don't go to the hotel for two or three days or a week if you're in town. If you're a child, you go to somebody's house for a sleepover. But adults, we tend to come home every night. That's the best plan. Come home every night. Come home to Jesus. Be in the Word every day. Stay, remain, abide in the truth of God's Word. Davis spoke about this in his essay, how distracted and distracting the world is. How do we remain in a short-term, short attention span world? These guys do not remember a cell phone-free world. The kids this age, they are not used to waiting for something or tolerating inconvenience. What do you mean supply chain issues? What do you mean I can't have something in three seconds flat? Teenagers did not grow up with phones and video game controllers attached to the base. They didn't grow up in a time where it took, oh, how many seconds? Maybe a minute or two to get online instead of, it's instantaneous. Now, everything for them, everything today is instant. It's convenient. It's wireless. These guys will walk into your home and ask without shame, what's the password for your wireless internet? As a kid, I would never have thought to do that, but that's just what you do today. Ours is a short-term, drive-through world obsessed with the quick fix, the instant message, the fast buck, and instant gratification. We have to have it now. And into this world comes this voice telling us to slow down, to dig in, to hold on. Jesus says, remain in me. Remain, stay, linger, abide. That is so out of place in our context. How do people shaped by a 24-hour news cycle of spinning and hyping and forgetting learn to develop a relationship that is described in agricultural terms, planting, tending, harvesting, all of which require extreme patience? How do we develop that? Well, this command to remain in the vine comes with an amazing promise. Remain in me, Jesus says, even as he promises, I remain in you. We are all tempted to think that we can disconnect from the vine from time to time. We can go without the flow of Jesus' life-giving words once in a while, because after all, it's not like faith shrivels up and dies on Monday if I'm not in church on a Sunday. Chances are, though, if we miss worship, we miss the word during the week. How? Well, don't raise your hands, but anyone here with an overcommitted, overflowing schedule? Work, sports, kids' activities work, stuff around the house, more kids' activities, work, and then there's the internet and there's smartphones. The average person touches their smartphone 2,617 times a day. 
the average person spends 195 minutes on their smartphone a day. That's three hours and 15 minutes a day. Well, good thing we have all those Bible apps, right? Because that's what we're doing. <laughs> no, 80% is games, social media, stuff like TikTok. Pretty sure our teenagers could tell us something about 195 minutes a day on their phones or more than that. It seems like the younger you are, the more time you spend, but we all need to watch out for that. John Piper is a Baptist preacher and author in Minneapolis. He says, one of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from lack of time. It's hard to say how long we can remain in Christ without the word of his gospel flowing through us. But the hard truth is this. Branches disconnected from their life giving source of nourishment, dry up and die. Faith, if it's not connected to the power source of Christ and word and sacraments, is not growing. It's dying. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Spiritual life, spiritual activity, faith, isn't just an add-on to an already busy life. It's the main thing. It's the essential thing. It's the most important thing. Now, I know that our five young people would disagree with this, but I'm going to suggest that they don't really know that yet. They don't really have a clue. They're unique. They are gifted. They are talented, athletic, social. So many gifts and talents in this group of five. But they're so young, and they don't know what's coming at them in life. I would ask you, did you know what was coming when you were 14 years old? As I look back on my confirmation 43 years ago, I didn't have a clue about two things. Number one, I didn't have a clue about all the challenges and frustrations that life would bring. And I didn't know about all of the astonishing blessings and the ways that Jesus would shepherd me all life long. So Jesus says that branches, we branches, go through a regular pruning process to bear more fruit. I'm not a gardener. I know very little. But I do know that plants prosper best when they are pruned and trimmed. But for the Christian, pruning can mean suffering and hardship. It can be painful. It can bring pain. Loved ones get sick and die. The best of friends can become the worst of enemies. Chronic pain, illness, depression can settle in. But the believer knows that pruning and suffering produce patient endurance, and patient endurance produces tested character, and tested character produces hope. Hope and change and growth, empowered by the Spirit, by Christ and his word, not hype and blame prompted by Satan and the world. Better to be pruned and trimmed and nurtured by the master gardener than cut off for lack of fruit. As we remain in Jesus, he says that we bear fruit. He says it seven times. He uses the word fruit seven times. Not just fruit or some fruit, but much fruit. And more and more as we grow in knowledge and faith, more and more as we remain in Jesus and his word. What does fruit look like? Well, it's faith expressing itself in love. It's God's people in every circumstance responding to God's boundless love with selfless love of their own. Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Kind words, kind thoughts, kind actions. You want a successful life? Here it is. Not dollars and cents. A faithful, fruitful life that looks to Jesus and honors God the Father. The very last verse of our text, My Father is glorified by this, that you continue to bear much fruit, and prove to be my disciples. 
There is no five-step plan to spiritual success. There's no magic bullet of a four-step approach to spiritual growth. There's one thing. One thing. Jesus says, remain in me. Flowers don't read books with titles like how to get more nutrients out of the soil. They stay. They remain in the dirt, in the soil, soaking up nutrients, growing and maturing. Oranges don't attend motivational seminars entitled how to squeeze more out of yourself than you ever thought possible. They don't contemplate their inner orange. They don't read books that promise a more appealing you in just 30 minutes a day. Oranges stay on the branch, on the tree, until the harvest, soaking up the nutrients, growing, maturing. God's faithful people do that too. Branches stay in the vine, soaking up the nutrients, growing, maturing, until the harvest. There's one step to spiritual success it's to remain in jesus and his word you want a plan to kill faith here it is guaranteed no worship no word of god no remembrance of baptism no holy communion no jesus and you repeat that you put that on automatic cycle that is guaranteed to kill faith it's so easy one step None of this. No worship, no word of God, no remembrance of baptism, no holy communion, no Jesus. Kill it. It's dead. Parents, is that what you want for your kids? Contramands, based on what we know, is that a good plan? Everyone here, should we go with that plan? Or should we do what by grace God enables us to do remain in Jesus it's who we are in Christ we're faithful fruitful branches of the true vine Jesus will enable you by his word and sacraments to grow and thrive in every age in every stage of life so we've got five families represented today four of them it's the end of their confirmation journey. The Bennett family, the Cuck family, the Wetterow Solovio family, and the Smith family. Smiths, you've been bringing kids for confirmation classes for more than 20 years, I think. And this is the last one. And for Frudenwalds, it's one down, one to go. But honestly, it's not the end of anything. Brindley, Madison, Davis, Summer, and Katya. It's just the next stage of life with Jesus. He is the vine. You are the branches. Remain in him. He will remain in you. And you will bear much fruit. Without him, he says, you can do nothing. With him, you can do anything he wants you to. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. On the top of page 12 is the Nicene Creed, our confession of faith for this day. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated. During the musical interlude, please take a moment and sign our friendship register. You'll find that little black notepad on either side of the aisle. Find it for yourself, sign it, and pass it on. Thank you. Please stand, I'm sorry, remain seated for the prayer of the church. New hymnal stuff, still getting used to that. Um, we have an intercessory prayer. We want to remember Paul Rosenau. He and his wife Ruth have returned from Florida, but Paul is quite ill and is now under hospice care at Rennes in Rhinelander. We pray. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. We remember at this time Paul Rosenau, 
who is seriously ill under hospice care. Remember those, Lord, who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. At this time, we'll have the rite of confirmation. Dearly beloved, when you were little children, you were received into God's covenant of grace in holy baptism. And now, having learned the meaning of this covenant from your instruction in the Word of God, you stand here before God in this Christian congregation to confess your faith in the triune God and to dedicate yourselves, body and soul, for time and for eternity to your God and Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I now ask you the following questions so that you may make confession of your faith. Do you this day, in the presence of God and of this Christian congregation, acknowledge the gifts which God gave you in baptism, namely the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? If so, then answer together, I do. Do you then reject the devil and all his works and ways? Then answer, I do. Do you believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth? Then answer, I do. Do you acknowledge that you were conceived and born in sin and that you have sinned against God's holy commandments in thought, word, and deed? Then answer, I do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is both true God and true man? Then answer, I do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior from the curse and guilt of sin? that all your sins were miraculously borne by him in his suffering and death, and that through the shedding of his precious blood, all your sins have been forgiven? Then answer, I do. I do. do you believe in God the Holy Spirit, who brought you to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and who continues to nurture and sustain you in the saving faith? Then answer, I do. I do. do you believe that the 66 books of the Bible are the inspired inerrant word of God and the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church taken from the Bible as you have learned to know it from Luther's catechism is the true and correct one then answer I do. I do. Do you desire to be a communicant member of the evangelical Lutheran church and of this congregation then answer I do. I do. You also as a communicant member of the evangelical Lutheran church intend to continue steadfast in the confession of the church and suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it, then answer, I do so intend with the help of God. Finally, do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the guidance of the divine word, to be diligent in the use of the means of grace, to live your life as a disciple of Christ, and in faith, word, and deed, to remain true to the triune God even until death, then answer, I do so intend with the help of God. Receive the blessing of the Lord. Brinley Reese Bennett, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Madison Rose Fruit and Wall. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Davis Michael Cuck, call on me in the day of trouble. 
I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Psalm 50, verse 15. Summer, Sadie Smith, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. Katya Georgievna Solovio. In God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? Psalm 56, verse 11. Upon your voluntary confessions of faith and promises, I, in the name of the Church of Christ, invite and welcome you as communicant members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and of this congregation to participate in all the rights and privileges of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We bow our heads for prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your great goodness in bringing these souls to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the truth of the gospel revealed through him. We thank and praise you that you have enabled them both with the heart to believe and with the mouth to confess your holy name. Strengthen them by the Holy Spirit that they may daily increase in living faith, in godly fear, in patience under trials, in true knowledge of you, and in all other things profitable for their eternal salvation. Grant that they bring forth the fruits of faith and continue steadfast and victorious until the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Depart in peace. Please stand as our service continues. On page 14 with the sacrament, page 14. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God through Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his willing sacrifice on the cross took away the sins of the world and by his glorious resurrection restored everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, O God our Father, 
with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to them, and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated. At this time, we invite communicant members of our congregation or of Sister Wells or ELS churches to join us in receiving the Lord's Supper at the direction of the ushers. The hymns that will be sung are printed out for you in the worship folder. Uh, the communion class, the confirmation class, will commune first together, and then the ushers will resume after that. Come, for all is ready. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Well, once again, welcome to all of you who are here today. A few announcements. We've got fellowship time, coffee and treats. Uh, I'll, I'll walk out with the confirmands and we'll probably stand in the welcome center so we don't get you bottled up in here because I know you want to get at those treats and that coffee. Um, you can do that and greet them as well. Uh, STEM camp applications are on a table in the fellowship hall. Uh, Vacation Bible School takes place a week after that just so you have that date in your minds for Vacation Bible School. And then the grief support group. Uh, we had a grief support group that has met uh, monthly for quite some time, and then we took a, well, a COVID-related break. But that is beginning again, the first Wednesday of each month, so June 1st at 11 o'clock in the Welcome Center, a grief support group if you want to come and be encouraged, study the scripture, spend time with others who might be experiencing the same kinds of griefs. Uh, Please join us for that. I'm happy to answer any questions. Blessings on your day. <laughs>